6910 McGinnis Ferry Road. Our church home. Amazing things happen here. Here in this place, the hurting are healed. The lonely are welcomed. The invisible are seen. Here we lift our hurts and our hopes to God. We're encouraged, inspired, challenged, convicted, and called. Here at 6910, we recognize that we are all imperfect people with unfinished stories. But somehow, strangely, mysteriously, miraculously, there is something gradually being perfected in us every time we gather. Every individual story with its successes and sorrows, every unique believer with his or her faith and doubt is being forged into a true family of faith, a family that is nothing less than, nothing more than, and nothing other than the visible presence of the risen Christ on earth. The church of Christ in every age beset by change, but spirit-led, must claim and test its heritage and keep on rising from the dead. Friends, I want to encourage you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, and we'll begin reading that passage in just a moment at the end of chapter 28. Before we do, I want to introduce that today we begin a brand new series, a series of sermons that I simply want to call 6910, a sermon series about this place, about what it means to be the body of Christ here in this place as we gather every week and then scatter in his name to prove the resurrection with our lives. I've said before and I'll say it again that the church universal, the the church in the world is intended to be the visible presence of the risen Christ in this world. I mean, we are the evidence. Last week on Easter Sunday, I told you there is no greater evidence of the resurrection of Jesus than the changed lives of those of us who call him Lord. We are walking, talking, living, breathing evidences of the resurrection. The question remains every morning when we wake, will we live this day as evidence of his capacity to bring me up from the dead? to be living, breathing evidences of his resurrection. Now, this series, however, is supposed to be about this church. The church universal is intended to be the visible presence of the risen Christ in the world. But this series, 6910, is about what it means to be the visible presence of the living Christ here at this address and beyond. And I want to preach for a little while about some family topics. This is a series of family talks, if you want to think of it that way, around the family table for a couple of reasons. First, I want to preach to you because of my call to be faithful and obedient to God's instruction, God's mandate, God's assignment that he has given me in these series of sermons that he has laid upon my heart. But secondly, I want to preach this series of sermons out of a love that I have for you, this church family. Do you know that my family has been here with you longer than we have served any other church in our ministry together of uh, 30 plus years of preaching ministry. We have been with you longer than we have been anywhere. And over a let, oh, (laughs) sure, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's worth celebrating, I suppose, right? But I say that to say this. In 11, and, and 11 years and some change, I have seen the evidence of the resurrection in you. I have. 
I've seen you embody the love of God. I've seen you in flesh the compassion and grace and welcome of Jesus in this place with each other, with us, with those who would come seeking a home. I've seen it. And I just want you to know that you are evidence to me that he is alive. Have I told you lately how much I love being your pastor? Because I do. And today I stand before you as one who is absolutely convinced, I am under conviction that God is up to something in this church. We surely are experiencing the winds of revival. These past three months, the first three months of this year, we've had 40 people join the fellowship of this congregation, some new believers who have walked through the waters of baptism. We not only have had 14 baptisms in three months, but we have baptisms scheduled for every Sunday of this month and beyond. God is up to, I might even say that the choir preached my sermon. God's hand is upon this place. God's hand is upon this place. And, and because it is, for such a time as this, there is no greater time, no greater urgency than right now to preach with conviction about what it means to be 6910. If God truly is up to something in the lives of the families of this church, and I have seen the transformations and you have experienced them, if God truly is up to something and there is a bit of a revival emerging among us, then to be good stewards of that revival energy, it's time to be serious about what it means to be 6910. What does it mean to be this church family for this age? Now, to do that, I want to talk first about some of the challenges that are facing churches all over the country. I have friends and ministry all over the place, and we share in common some of the same challenges that we see from city to city, state to state. And this series is going to be about what it will take to build upon the foundation that Christ has laid for us in this church. It will be about what it takes, what will be required of all of us to be good stewards of the reviving energy that we see God bringing to us in this church. But it begins with being honest. It begins with focusing on some of the challenges that are facing churches all around us. Now, earlier this year in January, we had what we called our Leader Summit, a JCBC Leader Summit. We had about 70 of our core leaders, deacons, deacon emeriti, stewardship committee members, pastors council, all the pastors. And we gathered overnight and I shared with them some of the challenges that I want to share with you as we prepare. This sermon is a bit of a setting of the table for a series of what it will take to become a church of continued thriving and flourishing these next several years ahead. And I want to share with you what I shared with them one Friday night. The message today I want to call the polycrisis of the post-pandemic church. The polycrisis of the post-pandemic church. Church, polycrisis, meaning the multiple tiered crisis that is facing every church that I know, at least in this country and many places around the planet, but especially in this country, a polycrisis, multiple challenges all at once. The first, the, the polycrisis of the post pandemic church begins with something I've told you for years. For years, you've heard me preaching about what Phyllis Tickle tells us, the church theologian and historian, that about every 500 years, the church has to make some serious decisions. Every 500 years, if we look at our history, we see that the church comes across some social and cultural and ideological changes that will force the church to make serious decisions about what it must do to be faithful to its mission in that current era in which it, it lives. And it turns out that every 500 years, they have to make some decisions about what to let go of, what to jettison, and what to hang on to, and what to embrace in order for the message of the gospel to live and breathe and continue to rise. 
So around the 4th and 5th centuries, we call this the, the Constantinian synthesis, where the church became the state church. And, and what was once a persecuted people, a persecuted church became a, a church of power and privilege and influence. And the next 500 years, they would have to, to test its heritage. They would have to test whether they could still be the people of the suffering Jesus while having all of this power at their hands, at their disposal. About 500 years later, around 1154, a great schism takes place between the church in the east and the church in the west. Or if you're looking at me, the church in the east and the church in the west. And the Roman Catholic Church splits off from the Eastern Orthodox Church and major differences in, major differences in practice and belief and orthodoxy and orthopraxy begin to emerge. And then another 500 years later, in 1517, the Protestant Reformation begins with immense changes and the Roman Catholic Church splits and the Protestant Reformation is underway and Immense changes in the how-to and the what-fors and the why behind what we do in our faith. And then 500 years later, here we are again. Here we are in the midst of a tsunami of technology, the likes of which we could have never imagined generations ago. And now social change, cultural change, ideological changes. So that now if you look up and look around, we live in what is now called a post Christian era where the church has been dislodged from its seat of influence and, and control and power in the power systems around us. And so no longer does the church have the same kind of social and political clout and influence and power that it once had. And if you have any doubt that what I'm saying is true, just drive by any ball field on a Sunday morning and you'll see that our, our neighbors and even we ourselves at times have very little problem whatsoever prioritizing and misprioritizing the place of the church in our lives. But I've been saying that for a long time. I mean, I said that even before the pandemic. I said, these are huge changes and here we are in the midst of the next 500 year rummage sale where we got to get rid of some things and we hang on to others. I've been saying that for a while. The truth, the truth is there are other challenges that have emerged in the last few years that amplify those challenges. See, those, those challenges, those are not our fault. It's not our fault. It's just our turn, right? It's our turn to be on watch when we are going through major seismic shifts in the history of the church. But lately, there's, there's been some more challenges to emerge around the pandemic and beyond. For example, if you just focus our attention to the neighborhoods around where we live, in the suburbs of North Atlanta, in, in our hood, around here, you realize that if you live in any place at all that has any kind of means or resources or affluence, that means that people have options about where to spend their time and energy and money and investment, right? And it's just a thing. And we look up and we recognize that if you have the freedom to travel, you travel. If you have the resources to have another place to live, you have a couple of places to live. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. But it has an impact on what it means to be the church. Not only that, I could throw in a little talk about consumerism, about how you and I are like fish in the water who don't know that they're in the water with consumer mindedness. We walk into church like we walk into Costco looking for a deal. And, and, and if, if the program is impressive enough for my kids and the music is inspiring enough and if the sermons are short enough, <laughs> then I'll stay here long enough to be satisfied. But I do have the freedom, you know, to go down the road or up the road or watch online any number of wonderful programs. Now, on top of all that, there's something else. And I talked about it a little bit last year. And I'm talking about the polycrisis. It's not just one. 
The poly crisis, the multi-tiered crisis facing the church in every area, on every friend and ministry, every colleague I know is facing it. And last year I talked about this, that once the pandemic came, the church went into a state of CPR. COVID-19, political division, racial tension. Political division, racial tension, COVID-19, political division, racial tension, CPR, right? Man, I, I compared notes with friends of mine in ministry all over the place. And the same challenges that we have seen around here, they have seen as well. During COVID-19, if we thought that the pandemic was over the moment we came back into church that first time in the fall, boy, were we wrong. The impact of the pandemic is still rippling through the lives of families and churches all around. I mean, we would get emails during the height of the pandemic that would read something like this. If you make us wear masks, we will not come back to that church. But then, then I saved that, flagged it, got to get back to that one. Open the next one. If you don't make us wear masks, we're not coming back to church. I'm like, okay, so that's a (laughs) win-win. COVID-19, CPR, political division, man. There was a time, and it wasn't long ago, I'm talking like, I don't know, yesterday, (laughs) where the moment something is said on a national scene, then I would get emails like, if you say something about this, then that's going to sound too political. You better keep your mouth shut about that. And then I would get emails such as, You are going to say something about this, aren't you? Because I can't be a part of a church that is silent about something so important. CPR. Racial tension. Oh, that summer. Whether we're talking Ahmaud Arbery or or George Floyd or or we're talking about the, the marches or the riots or the demonstrations or the dialogues that were happening and not happening. Man, did I get some emails. And so did my colleagues. You're not going to say anything about this, are you? Because if you do, that's just going to strike a nerve. It's going to trigger something, and it's going to get really bad. You don't say anything about it. And then I'd get another email. You are going to address this, aren't you? Because if you don't, that's silence, and silence is compliance, and I can't be a part of a church that is quiet about something like this. C-P-R. Now, on top of all that, I'm talking about the poly crisis of the post-pandemic church. On top of that, all you got to do is throw in a little discontent with with somebody's Sunday school teacher or the sermon was to this or to the other, or or you throw in some mistrust of the institution in general, which is a thing nowadays in this current milieu that we find ourselves in. You, You throw in any number of those challenges and the result is the same. Immense withdrawal and separation and disengagement, the likes of which at least I have never seen in my lifetime. It's almost like, remember when you were a kid and you put the bowl of pepper in the water and you drop that piece, that, that drop of dishwashing liquid in, on top of the pepper, remember, and the, and the pepper would go whoop. That's the church. We have scattered. And there has been immense withdrawal and disconnection at every turn. And that's part of the poly crisis. But can I tell you that all the conditions I just described, those aren't the problems. Those are the symptoms of the problem. Those aren't the problems. Those are the symptoms of a greater problem. Do you remember that I I talked about the pandemic being what I called apocalyptic? Not to be doom and gloom about it, but I said this was, this was an apocalyptic era. And I meant that in the, in the sense of the Greek word apocalypsis, which is a word that means the revealing or the unveiling or the uncovering, apocalypsis. That during the season of crisis, it uncovered, it revealed, it unmasked a variety of patterns and problems within the church in America lying just beneath the surface. One of those challenges, one of those problems that it, it, it revealed this <laughs> difficult season was what I called spiritual codependency. That for generations, we have taught churches 
to depend on the institutional church to do faith for you. We have said, look, we're going to have the best program. You just bring your kid. It's going to be impressive. They're going to love it. They're going to stay here, and we're going to make sure that they're happy here. And then as they're happy, we're going to give you what you want. The music's going to be really inspiring, and the sermon's going to be really tolerable. <laughs> and then we're going to do kind of a jug-to-mug mentality. You all just bring your mugs, and we'll fill it up with our jug of whatever it is that we think will inspire you and keep you long enough for your consumer satisfaction rate to be high enough to stay here and not go anywhere else. And what we do inadvertently is teach whole generations to depend on the church to do faith for you. Then what do you do when you shut down? How am I supposed to have fellowship if I don't meet in room 416 on Thursday? How am I supposed to worship if I don't have an orchestra to, to guide me or a choir to sing over me? What, how am I supposed to practice hospitality or, or mission? How am I supposed to be generous if I don't have a plate passing me by in my pew? And yet even this ecclesiastical codependency, this spiritual codependency that we have been culpable of creating with churches all across America, it has not only crippled us, but it's also not the problem. <laughs> Even that that I'm describing is a symptom of the problem. Okay, so big shot, what's the problem? The problem is the failure of churches in America to truly make disciples of Jesus Christ who can weather any storm in life. We, we have done great work at creating programs that satisfy the needs and scratch the itches of so many different needs around us. And yet, have we made disciples who look like Christ and behave like Christ and react to crises like Christ? And I say we have failed at that in large scale over the last several generations. And, and the reason I believe that is because if we had been doing that, well, then the pandemic would have been our finest hour. The church, we would have been a ballast in the ship. We would have been a port in the storm. We would have been a lighthouse at sea. We would have been the non-anxious presence in the midst of a very anxious time. And yet, churches all across our country and members in those churches and pastors in those churches behaved very similar to the rest of the world and lost our ever-loving minds. So, what do we do? When he ascended to heaven, he said one thing. He gave us one commission, one common mission, one thing. And he said it here, and we read about it in chapter 28 of Matthew's gospel, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. One thing he said to do, make Disciples, and some verses in Scripture are so familiar that they kind of blur into kind of an elastic consciousness, and we just read right by it, and we lose the power of the punch of that particular passage. When he says make disciples, he means cultivate in people the character of Christ so that as they live and grow and move and groove and have their being, they behave more like Christ today than they did yesterday, but not quite as much as they will tomorrow. Make disciples who are apprentices to Jesus. In fact, I like to think about this verse with a, a colon. Like, and therefore, go make disciples, colon, and here are the two ways to make them. Baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. Baptizing and teaching. Baptizing. And not simply baptizing them for the, the remission of sins or to, the, to symbolize the remission of their sins. Not just to demonstrate new faith. 
but baptize them, immerse them in the way of Jesus. Immerse them in my way of life. Immerse them so that they, they're saturated with the mind of Christ and the heart of God and the action of the Spirit. Baptize, immerse them so that they think of nothing else of higher priority than to spend time with me every day so that I can shape them and form them and forgive them and heal them and challenge them and compel them, baptize them and teach them. Teach them everything that I have taught you. Teach them to obey what I have taught you so that it becomes an instinct to them. So that when they see a hungry person, they don't think twice. They give them food. When they see someone thirsty, they give them drink. When they see a stranger who is alone and outcast, they welcome him in. And when they know of someone who is sick or imprisoned, they attend to them. Not because of their will, but because they have surrendered their will to my will and they have become my disciples. And they do instinctively what I would have done because you are making of them apprentices of me. And I ask myself, where has my energy and attention and focus as a pastor been all of my life in terms of creating that? In terms of steering the energy and the vision and the priorities of a congregation towards the one thing he told us to do. Make disciples. And I think about Madeline Lingle, whose quote will follow us through this series. Listen to these words. We draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. My question for you is, is there a light in you that is so lovely that the people around you see it and they want with all of their heart to know the source of that light. Our church at 6910 must be about the singular pursuit of igniting and fanning into flame that light that will draw all people to Christ. I want our children in this church to, to grow up knowing that they they can walk in the light and live in the light and become a light for Christ. And for that to not simply be things that you would expect a pastor to say. But for it to be everything, everything. Go and make disciples. Now, when I shared this with our leaders at the Leader Summit, I also said there is one thing that this will require. A shift in, oh, everything we do. To the extent that everything we do is in service to making what we are referring to as more and deeper disciples of Jesus. Now, we've been using that language every day among the pastor staff and among uh, lay leadership. But I am here to tell you this sermon series is about what must happen at 6910 to be devoted to making more and deeper disciples of Jesus? Now, what do I mean by more? What I mean by more is more. <laughs> Numerically more. Taking people who have never known a relationship with Jesus and loving them into a relationship where they trust him with their whole life. And everything changes for them because they met a man who told us everything about ourselves. I'm talking about more. And this series, we're going to talk specifically about how does our church equip its members to tell your story in such a way that you bring others into a saving knowledge of the truth with Christ in a way that is comfortable and in a way that is natural, in a way that feels like it's you talking and not some formula that you're cramming down a friend's neck, but rather it's a story that you know because you have lived it and experienced it. We're going to talk about what it means for you to love someone into a faith that changes them 
forever. So when I talk about more, I mean more people, more baptisms, more members, more disciples who become apprentices to Jesus. And what do I mean by deeper? What I mean by deeper is deeper in every conceivable way. Deeper commitment, deeper love, deeper passion, deeper priority. I'm talking about being able to be at 6910 and point to the one, two, three people with whom I share everything. And, and, and that's the one who holds me accountable. And I've been praying for her and, and he's been praying for you. And, and we care for one another in such a way as to heal our wounds, confess our sins, tell our secrets so that every day that we walk, we have a deeper walk with him because of a connection we have with each other. I'm talking about deeper discipleship where we refuse to splash around in the shallow end of the pool and we dive deeply into biblical literacy and and not just knowing what the Bible says, but what the Bible means and how it applies to our life. I'm talking about a deeper understanding of God's call on your individual life where you know you have been gifted with these particular gifts and you have been called to put those gifts into service and into action in the Lord's church here at 6910. I'm talking about deeper commitment where you realize this year on April the 7th, I am more loving than I was April the 7th of last year. I am more generous than I, I have given more financially to kingdom causes this year than I gave April 7th of last year. I am actually more compassionate. I'm actually more patient. I'm actually more, more hospitable and welcoming because some things have been happening in my life where I have been rooted more deeply in the character of Christ. Our singular pursuit right now is the making of more and deeper disciples of Jesus. So can I ask you to think for just a moment, what would it mean for more and deeper love to come to your heart? What would it mean for you to experience more and deeper faith right now? The church of God in every age, beset by change, but spirit-led must claim and test its heritage and keep on rising from the dead. Beloved, right here at 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road, God is raising us up for something big. And it requires every heart to be yielded. It requires every mind to be open. It requires every sleeve to be rolled up. And it may be that you're here today and you're hearing me talk this way and you recognize that for you, God has already been calling you to more and calling you to something deeper. It may be that where you are right now, you recognize that you have been playing a game, that you've been doing the church shuffle and you've been checking the boxes and doing what you think good Jesus-loving people do, and that's all good and fine and well, but maybe today something has happened in you and, and a space has opened up where you recognize that you haven't given everything to him. Everything. And until we give everything to him, he is not everything to us. Maybe right where you are today, sitting right where you are, looking right at me, you pray a prayer that sounds like this in your heart. God, I am tired. I am tired of attempting to rescue myself from all these broken patterns of self-destruction. And every time I do, I'm frustrated. Because I pick myself back up and realize that I am prone to the same failure and the same falling tomorrow as I was today. And I need your help. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask that you would 
forgive me of the places in this world that I have broken something beautiful. And I pray that you would heal me in those places where the world has broken something beautiful in me. And I no longer want to be the Lord of my own life. I yield myself to you. And you are my Lord and my Savior. And I pray in this moment that you would show me what you want from my life. And I pray that with my whole heart. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, maybe you're here and you prayed that prayer. Maybe you're even at home and you prayed that prayer and you're listening right now. Please understand that your, your first, most courageous step has already been taken. You've admitted that you're not enough on your own and that you need him. But your next step could be just as daunting to you, but I promise you, it's liberating. You need to tell somebody. That's why right now in our sanctuary, our pastors will be making their way to the front of the sanctuary because at the conclusion of this benediction, I want you to come and tell them what is happening in your heart. And maybe you don't even know how to describe what has been happening in your heart. And you let us pray with you to seek an understanding of what that is. It might be that you've given your life to Jesus and you need to tell somebody. It might be that as you've given your life to Christ, maybe for some time, you for whatever reason have never walked into the waters of baptism, but you recognize, no, I am convicted now. I want to be immersed in the belovedness of God, and I want the world to know that I belong to him and he is mine. Maybe you come today and tell us it's time for you to be baptized. It may be that today you look around and you recognize that this church really is filled with imperfect people with unfinished stories just like you. And you come to be a member of this church and you join and make 6910 JCBC your church home. Whatever the decision may be, I beg that you would make it today, not wait another week. And if you're listening online or listening later on in this week, will you call the church office? Will you email me so that we can talk and we can prayerfully take a next step together in your journey of faith? Now, whatever the decision may be, I want you to make it today. But now is the time for us as a body of believers a gathered body of believers to scatter and live as evidence in the world that he is alive. So as you're able, would you stand to your feet? And you may wish to hold a hand of someone nearby as we depart with these words of power and blessing. May Christ go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days that dark clouds roll in, and they will, to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his.